Hi everyone, good evening or good afternoon or good night, depending on where you are. Um, I'm um, Jennifer Nava Milliken, the director of the Center for Art in Wood, and I'm gonna get us started um, while everyone's getting situated. Uh, we have uh, an amazing program tonight and I'm just so, so thrilled um, to welcome tonight's guest. Um, so here we are, this is the second public event that's connected with the Center for Art and Woods upcoming exhibition and community program titled The Mashrabiyat Project. This project, which is made possible through generous support from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, centers on the Mashrabiyat. The Mashrabiyat is a scalable lattice screen that can be affixed to windows or installed in interiors and integrated into furniture. It simultaneously offers protection and ventilation as well as privacy from public view. It is an ancient device that forms the original premise for modern day air conditioning. The form evolved over time to serve a number of purposes, including separating interior spaces according to gender and function, providing shade from the sun and serving as a decorative element to otherwise austere building facades. The Mashobea became a framework for artisanal and decorative skill, displaying artful geometry and elaborate perforated designs to be a defining element of Islamic visual culture and ornament. The Mashobea of North Africa, fabricated of wood, which can expand and contract in response to the very intense climate of the region, are found in residential and religious spaces alike. Comprised of thousands of simple, individually lathe turned components, they are assembled without glue or fasteners to create large, scalable elements and furnishings that are complex and ornate in design. Bountiful in metaphorical evocations, particularly circulating around dualities of public and private, subject and viewer, denial and reclamation of space, and the porosity of boundaries. The Mashabe is an enduring symbol of Islam's cultural heritage and its influence on vernacular architecture and craft. And that's what we'll be looking at uh, in the coming months at the Center for Art in Wood. Seeing through space is one part of the upcoming project. It's an exhibition that makes use of the cultural significance and compelling decorative beauty of the Mashabe through the works of six artists. Each of these artists is rooted in a part of the Islamic world and each is woman identifying. Through this series of talks, you'll meet each of them leading up to the opening on March 3rd, 2023, not so far away. So tonight we welcome Anila Kayam Aga. Anila received her BFA from the National College of Arts in Lahore and an MFA from the University of North Texas. She works in a cross-disciplinary method with mixed media, not only metal and wood, but also light and space. Her work examines global and environmental politics, cultural multiplicity, and social and gender roles in our current cultural and global scenario. Viewing her conceptually challenging work evokes transformative experience, community and social connectivity, and metaphysical thought. Her work has been seen in solo and group exhibitions all over the world. I'm not going to name them all because there are many. Um, the list is very long. Uh, and it was included in a 2019 Venice Biennale collateral event titled She Persists with 22 contemporary feminist artists. She has received many, many, many prizes and fellowships um, including the Joan Mitchell Painter and Sculptors Award in 2019. And for her creative research, she was awarded the highest research honor by Indiana University in 2016, um, titled the Glenn W. Irwin Research Scholar Award. In 2020, she became the endowed chair of the Morris Eminent Scholar in Art at Augusta University in Georgia. And in 2021, she was named for the prestigious Smithsonian Fellowship in the Arts and worked with the museums in Washington, D.C. in May 2022. Her work has been collected and is held by institutions and private collectors around the world. It is my deepest pleasure to introduce Anila today to the Center's audience. She will talk about her work and the trajectory that brought her here to this project specifically. 
Uh, following that, she'll be open to questions from the audience. So please feel free to submit your questions or jot down your thoughts in the chat, and then we will pick them up um, when we get to that part of the talk. And then, of course, as always, live transcription is available on your device for this talk, um, and it's going to be recorded, simulcast on Facebook, and then eventually it will come up on um, the Center for Art and Woods YouTube channel for uh, asynchronous viewing. So with that, I'm going to close my screen and hand it over to Anila. Thank you so much, Nava. That was really lovely. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, to start with, I want to thank Nava for selecting me as one of the artists. That was a stroke of luck for me, of course. Um, so this is my 23rd year in the U US, almost half of my life spent here now. Um, I've traveled through various states. Um, I started from Virginia, moved to Texas, and then moved to Indiana. And from there, I moved to Georgia, which I live here part-time only. Um, and then this is my husband, Steve, who's also my partner. And we took a, a tiny vacation. We kind of snuck out and ziplined in, uh, in the Appalachian Mountains uh, recently, which was wonderful. We don't get a lot of time away from work, actually. So to start with, I'd like to walk you through where I come from so it makes sense why I do what I do. I was born and raised in Pakistan um, during really turbulent political and economic times in a very newly formed country whose roots are very ancient, yet the geographical borders were newly drawn. For those of you who may not know, Pakistan was part of India and was colonized by the British for centuries. Colonization comes with myriad problems that may never dissipate. After independence from the British, the subcontinent was divided into multiple countries. And Pakistan, in the process, decided to develop amnesia over its centuries old history which often happens when new regimes are born and need a new identity. Pakistan wanted a new identity that negated its Hindu roots and made alliances with Arab nations to show solidarity with the religion. Nothing else was in common really between the Arabs or Pakistanis at the time. Thus started a new era of looking away from the subcontinent's ancient history to form a new culture. Pakistanis are generally very gregarious, funny, smart, loving, with a great sense of humor, and love a good time, usually around food, song, and dance. But the false morality of the new country denied both song and dance, and especially integration of the sexes. Despite cultural disapproval due to the dominant religious practices and historical amnesia, I decided to attend the co-ed art school and oh, the horror. <laughs> the years at art college were wonderful. I had amazing feminist professors who encouraged us to go on marches with them to protest the Hadood ordinance, a set of laws that criminalized non-marital sex, including rape and have led to thousands of women being imprisoned for so-called honor crimes in Pakistan. In my late 20s, I moved to the US. As an immigrant, I had to start over. Dallas, Texas was home, and I went to the University of North Texas. I was often encouraged to conform and make work in a more Euro-Western style. After graduation, my move to Houston for an artist residency at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft freed me up and allowed me to make work without judgment. In the US, I faced discrimination as an immigrant and found much in common with the discrimination I had faced in Pakistan as well. Having moved around so much, I feel a deep connection to displaced people anywhere in the world. And this piece reflects my, uh, much of my oeuvre. Uh, commerce and trade have opened up cultures via assimilation and appropriation throughout the ages. Yet 
capitalism and colonization brings many problems in its aftermath. Currently, the biggest challenge affecting the planet is climate change. It seems much of the previously colonized regions of the world that were eroded with loss of resources and people through slavery and indentured labor still continue to pay the price in this current global scenario. I myself am responsible too, as I often travel. And this piece reflects the world back upon ourselves as nature and humans are inextricably linked. According to scientists, the planet's warming through climate change will continue its destruction, affecting the global south and its populations with rising waters causing people to become displaced in the low-lying areas such as Bangladesh, Japan even, Taiwan, Vietnam, the Bahamas, New Orleans, the west coast of the Americas, forest fires, drinking water shortages, I think no one will be safe. And the global north will have to contend with refugees showing up on its doorsteps. I suppose we could let them drown in the oceans or on the borders, but conversely, we could let them into our borders and start managing our contributions to the heating of the planet. I hope that maybe humans will choose humanity over their own comfort and economics. These, this piece and the two previous pieces reflects the present and future migration, migrations of people and animals, appropriation and commerce, and the breakneck speed of the use of the world's resources and the underserved communities of the world. Some lucky few may become naturalized and others will disappear or become extinct, unfortunately. I like the, in this passage of the book, The Invisible Dragon, Essays on Beauty by Dave Hickey. He writes, beauty is not a thing, the beautiful is a thing. In images, beauty is the agency that causes visual pleasure in the beholder. And since pleasure is the true occasion for looking at anything, any theory of images that is not grounded in the pleasure of the beholder begs the question of arts efficacy and dooms itself to inconsequence. This paragraph gave me the desire to create beautiful art. It may also have been due to the brutal critiques I received in grad school regarding my very highly crafted artwork. Often the comments circled around the inconsequential and banal nature of beauty. Then I realized the importance of investing my work with meaning. Over the past two decades, during my travels both to Pakistan and elsewhere, I have explored historical buildings. My process of self-discovery has led me to the conclusion that I am deeply interested in metaphorical art architectural spaces, interiors and exteriors, suggestive of the private, social and political domains. I'm further fascinated by the combination of the old and new architecture patched together to preserve both ancient and new, similar to human lives and relationships. I enjoy the experience of going to old places. I want my art to shift between the ideas of displaced and reconstructed identity reflecting my own experiences. And I wanted to touch upon literacy that allowed me to soar while using gender and its resultant issues as a point of discussion. I make my art excruciatingly beautiful, creating a cliffhanger where opposites collide or meet, creating a combustible moment. I want the viewer to gently confront the contradictory nature of all intersections while simultaneously exploring boundaries. Over the years, my art has grown more abstract with the narrative element dependent on both the invisible and the actual presence of displaced and gendered identities. This particular piece of beautiful despair was conceived and completed during the pandemic, thus reflective of the huge losses we have all faced, yet there's hope for renewal. I start with familiar Islamic motives. I have seen or photographed that in due course become reinterpretations of the original designs and allow me to infuse a contemplative focus uh, suggestive of the underlying order of both the cosmos and the natural world through symmetries found in nature. I was excited to work with the Mashrabia project as I feel it is perfectly suited to my work, 
that is uh, working with contradictions, such as the gaze and who is viewing whom, contradictory perspectives, desire for recognition, the hidden and the revealed. Often my goal is to explore the binaries of public and private, light and shadow, and static and dynamic by relying on the purity and inner symmetry of geometric design and the interpretations of the cast shadows in the sculptural installations. I enjoy the contradiction of in chaos enclosed within regimented geometries in the more intimate flat works or the chaotic immersive shadows that result from rigid geometric objects like the cubes. My artwork stems from a desire to research, review, highlight, or correct in some small measure the gender and racial imbalances that exist in the world due to race, color, creed, class, or gender. These familiar Islamic geometric motives due to their reproductions in public environments allow me to excavate and reinterpret these motives from the everyday and elevate them to the extraordinary to reveal the complexities of symbiosis between genders, cultures, and civilizations and the amorphous borders between them all. When in Pakistan, I found the gender imbalance in, and intolerance perpetuated by illiteracy and often the incorrect interpretation of religious dogma. And such, um, as well as perpetuated by the state sanctioned laws such as the Hadood ordinance, which I mentioned earlier. However, that's not only based in Pakistan or poor countries of the world. It is a global problem perpetuated by illiteracy, lack of opportunities and low economic conditions directly resulting in ill treatment of gendered people. As a young woman in Pakistan, I became very interested in the gender complexities in our societies. Over time here in the US through research and art making process, I continue to try to understand it all. I'm still not educated. <laughs> These last few years, I have read some books that blew my mind. Ain't I a Woman, White Fragility and Against White Feminism are all are critical and many may not appreciate them, but much became apparent to me for the defensiveness we encounter when we don't when dominant cultures create policy that affects all of us, that is white, brown, black, male, female, LGBTQ, or in between. And the intolerance and defensiveness harms all of us physically and mentally, I believe. Currently, I'm reading the book titled Strong Men by Ruth ben Giat to understand the authoritarian tendencies we are witnessing in global politics now. I may have become cynical as I see hypocrisy in world politics that elevates certain regions over others. During my research, I explored American artists such as Eva Hess and Cy Twombly and was drawn to their alternative style of drawing. I felt drawing had to be personal and for me it became a way of expression and I decided to stretch it to encompass mark making through multiple mediums. It also helped me open up to new worlds. In my drawings and flat work, embroidery takes the feminine into the masculine arena, subverting the known balance of power and ensuring con conversations are about the definitions of low craft versus high art and assigning feminine or masculine roles to objects, processes, and situations. I often think of the invisible women who hold families together, create Communities build homes and in spite of the issues besetting them, manage strengthen the face, faces of, face of adversity. I have been drawn to collecting um, surface pattern and textured textiles all my life, but initially shied away from exploring it in my work, although it showed up regardless. I think it was due to the condescending debate on pattern and decoration being too feminine and thus crafty and carrying little to no meaning while at grad school. I'm glad now that it's a thing of the past and there are many artists who are using it like Bisa Butler and Ann Wilson and many more. Recently, I listened to an amazing Smithsonian lecture by Julia Bryan Wilson discussing her book, Embellished Legacies. She discussed three recently rediscovered female artists that used 
textiles, embroideries, and patterning in their work. And I'm eager to read the book when it's available. I conceive the flat works often as a series of collage drawings, thinking of them like pages from a book. My drawings are concerned with similar objectives as the installations, but on a more intimate level. Over the years, I've also noticed I jump back and forth between um, in time and make new work to connect with earlier work that I may have done several years before. Usually the impetus is to explore how social and gender-based issues result from concepts constructed by our past and recent histories and traditions that continue to shadow us into the contemporary times. I use a mixed media approach. I explore the deeply entwined political relationships between gender, culture, religion, labor, and social codes. In my drawings, I have used combinations of textile processes such as embroidery, wax, dye, silk screening, uh, traditional drawing methods, as well as sculptural methodologies to reveal and question the gendering of textiles or craft work as inherently domesticated and excluded from being considered an art form. I add translucency by using wax and mylar to obscure or reveal layers similar to the concept of the mushrabias. My experience in, in both my native country and as an immigrant here in the United States inform and are woven into my work of redefining and rewriting women's handicraft as a poignant form of creative expression. The embroidery is used as a drawing medium to reveal the multiple layers resulting from the interaction of concept and process and to bridge the gap between modern materials and historical patterns of traditional oppression and domestic servitude. Much of my work is labor intensive, creating a narrative of revealing and concealing through process, materials and concept. And shadows add another layered dimension to the drawings and the piece becomes a three-dimensional object. I believe in building community in place I live, creating dialogue, tolerance, acceptance, and understanding within people of various economic and cultural descents. This desire to build bridges is generated by earlier memories from Pakistan. In the fall every year, my mother would invite women of the neighborhood to come and help make quilts. They didn't belong to any one particular social group. They would come with their needles and threads, making the quills by hand while talking about families, the neighborhood, and our community. The quills were the result of a social endeavor organized by my mother. So in my work, embroidery embodies an essential femaleness because of the push of the needle and the thread. Together represent the domestic identity of women and the ambivalent relationship to that identity. Furthermore, the drawing and the embroidery is a drawing line and beckons people in to look deeper as respective of gender, sexual preference, or cultural background. I hope it makes them rethink about their own histories and the prejudices we all carry. During the embroidery process, the myriad threads stitch the personal narratives of the community, thus creating beautiful but invisible stories within the very essence of the work. The surfaces are seductive and layered and may incite uh, exploration of issues of submission, oppression, and domesticities, domesticity. Sorry. Um, I connect the invisibility of the absence or presence of the feminine to the embroidery, linking, building, and making it part of the surface, quiet but graceful. In the drawings, the inserts or cutouts are often waxed to create translucency. And I limit the use of adhesives and depend on specific colored threads to tie, connect, and construct the tactile surfaces. And the surprise, surprise, the structures are often derived from architectural geometries suggestive of the male domain. Additionally, the drawing thread from a distance seems pretty insubstantial. However, up close, the viewer realizes that the drawings are held together by this ephemeral medium, thus instilling a new respect for the threads that connect, weave, and embellish our lives. Oops. 
move too fast. My large scale sculptural installations create universally welcoming environments through the interplay of light shadow, while the embroidered works on paper create intimacy and the presence of the feminine. Conceptually, using my own experiences as a woman of color, my artwork reaches beyond the personal to explore cultural binaries, such as light and dark, masculine, feminine, public and private, definite and amorphous, life and death, and religious and secular. Growing up in an amnesia-induced Muslim country led to many early experiences of exclusion due to my gender. Subsequently, being an immigrant in an alien culture has its own challenges as well. Despite power inequities, home is a familiar place and the feelings of inclusivity, intimacy is what I have sought to recreate in my artwork. My sculptural practice was initially inspired by a visit to the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. There, I experienced a space that had inherent contradictions, that is similarities and differences like in both Pakistan and the US. Yet I had freedom to experience the place without um, bias. The complex, the Alhambra complex was both alien built by the Moors, but also uncannily familiar. I use pattern and color to construct architectural environments that create contradictions such as male, female, light and dark, heavy and light, fragile and strong, to show that our lives are abound with contradictions. Vivid color combinations in, in abundance has often been attributed to cultures that were considered exotic and thus less valid than the more sophisticated European cultures where muted and neutral colors seem to rule. Thus, I use bright colored walls for the spaces I illuminate with my sculptures, once again, elevating that which has been considered unimportant. The resulting sculptures are steel cut with delicate lace-like patterns that reflect and refract light, integrating light and shadows with solid forms. My installations aspire simultaneously to be perceptually soothing and conceptually challenging. The shadows cast in all directions by the light spilling through the sculptures work magically, creating a dynamic transformation of the space in tandem with the itinerant movement of the audience and allow viewers to bask in universal splendor that belongs to all of us. In such a space, it becomes possible to explore the powerful dialogue of shared experience that transcends the barriers that exist due to gender, color, race, religion, and culture. Rethinking our relationships to the planet, empowerment of the world's populations, including the feminine, and revamping the educational materials is essential to the well being of the world population. And I strongly believe if we educate a single mom, the whole family will be literate. Maybe such a strategy will make politicians work harder on our, our behalfs. I wonder if that's the reason education is often poorly funded worldwide. Over the years, I've lived on the boundaries of different faiths, such as Islam and Christianity, and in cultures like Pakistan and the US, which has deep, deeply influenced my art making and giving it a simultaneous sense of alienation and transience that informs the migrants' experience. The use of a variety of media to create large scale in installations to question my place within these binaries allows me to inquire into the validity of our broad cultural acceptance of them. At the start and production of the first cube, I often discussed with Steve, my engineer, how scared I was that I was building a cube reminiscent of the Kaaba and what the ramifications could be if some fanatic took offense at my using it as an inspiration. In making the cube, I was essentially critiquing organized religion. My intent at the time was to rectify the injustices perpetrated on women and minorities in cultures across the world due to religious dogma, often I think based on incorrect interpretations of religious doctrine, which res reduces women to mere chattels used for procreation and domestic servitude by the very men who were supposed to make them feel safe and empowered. This piece was a way to redress 
the balance in occupying the often considered male position of an architect and using a structured geometric object built with materials again, often attributed to men. I had dealt with slights as a female while growing up in Pakistan. I had observed female relatives suffering domestic abuse with limited protections from male relatives and became quietly convinced to never place myself in a similar position. The perforated cube in Lacey Jolly or Mashrabia where the light was my way of using a female perspective in creating space that was in direct contrast to a masculine space. The inclusive spaces I create as by extension in, is an invitation to all people, irrespective of race, color, gender, class, or creed. In my opinion, discrimination in both the East and West may originate due to different reasons, but accomplish the same results, like keeping half of the world's population dependent and behind economically. Although recently, we have been shown that there's change in the air. In addition to questioning the assumptions behind the geometric or non-figurative form as a certain and static, my work also provokes an investigation into questions of authenticity, which are central to the post-colonial condition. The intertwining of light and shadow, original and derivative are the core of the various renditions of the pattern Thus, the mashrabia, the, they mirror the post-colonial quest for originality and purity and ultimately circular geometric pursuit where primary form can only be imagined and never really captured. In our current environment where difference and divergence dominate most conversations about the intersection of civilization, my artwork explores the presence of harmonies that do not ignore the shadows, ambiguities, and dark spaces between them, but rather explore them in novel and unexpected ways. Clearly, my installation projects use light and pattern along with the palpal palpability of reflection to question the assumptions of geometric design as a form of the pure and transcendent and thus opposite, opposite to representational art. The audiences presence becomes essential in experiencing a shared space while simultaneously affording intimacy, suggestive of the fluidity of human interactions. Often the large projects start with some political news such as the plight of refugees or immigrants, but also envelops my own experience of exclusion as a woman of color here in the US and simply as a woman in Pakistan. I have over the last many years experimented with painting the environments in dark colors and using multiple light sources to create overlapping shadows to demonstrate the requirement for multiplicity and intersectionality. As an immigrant who worked hard to help myself and many others in my community of artists, I hope the American dream comes true for many others who flock to the shores of the US. The dismissive rhetoric towards immigrants and refugees, people in need hurts my heart, mind, and soul. Millions of people come to the US. Millions of people came to the US during and after the Second World War, yet we find people of different colors from the global South to be more problematic, possibly reflective of Islamic Islamophobia. Fascism seems to be on the rise across the world and has, has affected the politics of even India, which ironically is composed largely of brown people. I think for art to become socially relevant for the general public to draw learnings and conclusions, there needs to be a connection that draws them in. Making work that reflects our current issues is important to me, like this piece, for instance. I like multiple other people, I, like other people, wanted to comment on the refugee problems both in Europe and the US. While living outside the US, people often talked about the US as a beacon of light for people to flock to. There in America, one can find freedom. However, the vision of America internationally may have tarnished over the past few decades. During the concept development and making of this project, I felt that the vision of America became a mirage where on arrival, 
the U.S. is unable to provide respite to the hungry and the needy as it was written on the Statue of Liberty. These, this piece and the previous slide were inspired by the beautiful book rests my mother used to read her Quran on. However, in this piece, I decided to remove the doorway as I wanted to comment on the lack of agency many people face when confronted by poverty, violence, and destitution, thus, rep thus representing people within the US who may also be struggling. Shadows fascinate me. They are conceptual drawings in space. A three-dimensional object flattens and overlaps due to light and where it's emanating from. Conceptually, it speaks volumes on how the world is porous yet siloed as well. There are boundaries one is not allowed to cross, keeping large populations in place, which to me is a very colonized way of perceiving the world. Many years over the years have influenced me. Robert Irwin, Shirin Nishat, Anne Hamilton, Mona Hatoum, Cornelia Parker, Theaster Gates, Raphael Lozano Hemmer, Maya Len. The list is very long. In some cases, the influence is not apparent in my work, but deals with the expansive nature of their works and how it allows me to expand my own work. And in other cases, like in this disc piece, you see Robert Irvin's influence visibly. I love artists and people who work with artists as imagination to do bigger and better is often very inspiring to me. Technology has become an integral part of my practice and working with fabricators allows me to work large, to create work that is often immersive and transformational. These two paintings were completed this year for my show in New York City at the Sundaram Tagore Gallery in Chelsea in September. I used Pietra Dura, a 16th century process invented in Italy and brought to India through commerce. The Taj Mahal was built in marble with an abundance of Pietra Dura techniques and is one of the great gems of the Mughal Empire that ruled India for numerous centuries. I use technology where artisans in the past carved by hand the patterns that adorned the Taj Mahal. For these paintings, a CNC machine was used to carve into the substrate and then filled with colored resin, emulating the technique used on marble. It is indeed a very complicated and time-consuming uh, process. When I was conceiving the idea for the Mashrabiya exhibition, we were in the second year of the pandemic. My older sister died the same year. And for me, her loss went really deep. As mentioned before, I was reading books like the 1619 Project, Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, Entire Woman, all really hard books. Many of these books deal with inequality in some fashion and results in control of bodies and minds, control of resources and borders, thus containment. I thought of making a cube as a void. I'm sharing a few production photos for a sneak preview. The work is in progress, so forgive the photos. My work has been has deep connections to jalis and mashrabiyas, which I use as a metaphor. Yet in this project, I chose a solid cube and added surface embellishment through language and pattern or languages. The small cubes that will create the large cube shape in space are solid and create uh, no immersive light or shadow to paint the walls. Some considerations for this project specifically were the weight we all carry. The weight of chaos, the messiness of human lives, as well as the desire for order and control, along with the resources we consume in large quantities, labor and the value associated to bodies that perform it. Human history from ancient, historic, and contemporary time periods show human goodness, ingenuity, vision, engineering, accomplishments, but it also shows humans have per perpetrated terrible inequities on people and the natural environment. Thus, I decided to use the cube format with multiple cubes. Often artists become known for a singular work, that is Robert Indiana for his love sculptures and me for my cubes. <laughs> so I decided to make multiple cubes for, to form a larger cube out of charred wood. There are 125 cubes size six by six in this piece. 
I conceived the project as a visual cube in an orderly fashion made with a small cubes, but during the hanging of them for testing, I realized that I seem to prefer the disorder. That is still to be determined. The individual pieces are approximately half a pound, each with five cubes hanging on a single cable. Black cubes with both English and Urdu script and crowned with an appropriated pattern showing the elegance and opulence that is tied to capitalism. I wanted to describe the types of authoritarian repression perpetuated and faced in societies across the world in spite of all the progress made in science and education. Using Urdu translations for the words in English on the cubes allows me to be represented. The installation has 26 words repeated to show the visual weight and size of the types of repression used to keep people fighting over scraps. The hanging cubes will play peekaboo, so as the audience moves around the work, they will engage with the huge weight, opulence, discrimination, and blackness of the piece. Black and short blocks are to represent the slave trade into the Americas alongside of the undervalued work gendered bodies perform for societies across the world. Black and short blocks further reference uh, black gold, oil, coal, and gas resources humans keep fighting wars over. The charring refers to skin texture and color. It references the area of the world where black and brown people live and are, are now being affected by climate change and past colonization still affects them. It also references the, uh, the refugees escaping climate disasters, wars, and economic issues. I thought of this mashrabya as a void without light from inside and only lit from the outside to be viewed, still to be determined as well. And that's the last of my slides, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk with Nava. Thank you so much, Anila. I am very honored to talk with you. Thank you so much. It's um, a pleasure. Likewise. Um, well, I, I have, um, first of all, I just want to thank you for um, not only giving us such a such a deep and incisive view of your the trajectory of your career and your thinking behind your work and your inspiration, but also for allowing us a sneak peek of of um, the work in progress. Um, it is it is really generous of you to do that because um, I think it raises so many questions. Um, in, especially in consideration of your work leading up to the work that you're going to be um, installing at the center. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think the most obvious of them, and certainly for our audience, I need to ask this question. And that is, what is your experience working with the material of wood versus uh, the steel that usually comprises your cube forms? Well, the first cube was made in plywood the first, the intersection piece. And then um, it was an artist proof. And then I switched to uh, steel because um, the particle wood was not very strong. So that first uh, artist proof is so delicate. I have to keep it in climate control environment. But this time working with this piece, it's hanging in the corner over there. Um, and that's why I'm looking at it. <laughs> but um, wood is heavy, it's strong, it's uh, luscious, it comes from the earth. And um, my experience working with it is that it creates beautiful texture on the outside when you char it. And it looks like skin or parched earth, uh, desert-like environments, you know, when you, when you walk through um, areas that don't get much rainfall. And so it has, um, it's doing everything I wanted it to do. I think I could have made uh, steel pieces and still shown it like this, but because it's the center for wood as well, it made really 
a great deal of sense to make the work in wood that I, you know, then could um, keep for showing again and again. So it it's really solid, it's heavy, and it looks luscious, I find. And that's that's something that's going to be really interesting to experience. Your work is so experiential in its relationship with, I mean, I mentioned earlier in the introduction that that um, I, I think when I think of your work, I think of um, space and light as being two mediums um, in that are shaped by your hands as well. And and I'm interested in in how you predict people will interact with the work when they wander into that space, where instead of um, uh, these these reflections of of patterns from the inside um, passing through uh the the decorative form of your cube instead the cubes will be absorbing light mm -hmm. um i am i'm hopeful that they will <laughs> the audience would appreciate that artists have to try new things experiment continue to develop the ooh, and um i i would be very interested in hearing what people say because you know a void is very different from a light emanating object and so um, to me it's exciting to try something completely the opposite of what I was doing or am currently doing this is like one of two new projects that I'm working on and it's just um uh, exciting for me to be able to make something that is completely the opposite of what I was doing because um, it's allowing me to see things from a different perspective and I think that that's really important as well and the mushrabia does that it gives you multiple perspectives and so I'm I'm I physically am doing that as well and I I'm um I hope that uh, it works out and I don't fall flat on my face. <laughs> no, it's already, it's already, I mean, just looking at the way you've approached the surface um, cube by cube, I know it'll be absolutely gorgeous and stunning to behold, but I think also your intent will be very clear to the visitors and the viewers who are spending time with it. Um, I um, I have one more question for you, and then I'm going to have, we have some really good questions coming up in the chat um, among our audience members. But I did want to ask you to talk um, specifically about what it means to be um, a woman identifying artist within the context that this exhibition and project invites. Well, it's uh, similar to what I already said that you know I deliberately put myself in the space where the expectancy is that a male artist would be positioned. And I think the mushrabia is a similar object because it hides women on the inside and allows men and women to interact through hidden spaces. And, you know, as an immigrant, as a woman, as a gendered person, often that is the position that women occupy or LGBTQ people occupy or minorities in a dominant culture occupy, we are hidden quite often and then suddenly something happens and we become visible. And so I think that, that that's, a, that's a very interesting place to be, the perspectives, the intent. Um, so I'm, um, I think uh, that's what I would you know, leave it at. I'm I'm very I'm particularly intrigued by um, the the ideas or the of uncovering and revealing labor, um, particularly because um, in the Middle East I'm thinking of you know the the imminent mundial event, uh, which is really um, focus, bringing into sharp focus that that um, question of labor practices and who who is seen um, and whose work is valued and whose work is just covered up under a lot of glitz um even well, though that's that's uh, exactly the the point like you know um women's labor um possibly 50 percent of the time goes unnoticed i think you know tending children or bearing children or 
you know, I mean, like you, when you become pregnant and then you, you know, you consider almost like a disabled person, um, you know, in this country, we are not allowed to make our own decision about our bodies. I mean, that seems anathema to me, considering how important um, autonomy is for a human being. And so women's labor, I mean, the reason why I'm drawn to this exhibition, I was so excited to participate in it with all the wonderful artists you selected and you especially was because it's highlighting us in a, in a, in a way that allows us to explore both sides of the coin, so to speak. And I, I, I mean, I, I've been doing that for the last 20 years of my career here in the US. And it's just a, a fabulous opportunity to be able to explore a void now instead of like a lighted object. And I'm so grateful, thank you. Uh, we're grateful and we're, we cannot mask our enthusiasm and excitement. Um, and I um, before I before I mention a question, I just want to say hello to um, everyone who's joined us tonight. There are some people from the West Coast who are here, um, and that's really exciting. Um, and um, and a lot of artists who are doing really fabulous and really important work. So um, just big um, embrace to everyone who's doing that. Hi, Umera. Yes, we were talking about you. Um, and, um, but I wanted to mention um, Shaley, um, who is a, a choreographer um, here in Philadelphia, who specializes um, in bringing um, the, the language of South Asian um, traditional dance into a contemporary space. Um, uh, she is, first she said that she loves your perspective and your incredibly intricate work. Um, and she agrees with you about the South Asian continent and her selective amnesia about art. Uh, she grew up in India, um, and as I said, now is in, in Philadelphia. Um, but she adds a question. She's curious if you've ever faced the burden from fellow Pakistanis to retain the purity of your craft, and purity is in quotes, um, as it was centuries ago. Um. To tell you honestly, um, thank you very much for all you have said about my work. I really appreciate it first. Um, but you know, I uh, I exhibited in 2010 in in Pakistan, and after that, I have not been able to exhibit there. I've been asked uh, a few times, but um, the weight of my work is so heavy that it's hard to transport it all the way to a country, a third world country. So I really don't know how they would respond to my work um, other than from the travelers who have seen it in some form or fashion around the world, possibly in Dubai or Abu Dhabi for the art fairs. Um, I have not received any kind of uh, dictate where I should be doing something particular. Most often people just love it and, um, you know, um, give me positive energy and I appreciate that. I mean, I would love to get um, critiques, definitely critiques help us make us better, but um, I'm also grateful that, um, you know, that people are responding to the work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think they have to. It, it is. Um, I think one of the effective things about it is this sort of demonstration or harnessing of a phenomenology of space and um, absolute controlling of an environment to create an emotional and transformational experience for the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and Nishé has written um, that um, such complex work. I agree. Um, You've given Nishé a lot to think about, and um, especially thoughts about binaries and otherness. Um, and um, and there's a note on there also gender. So I think I think your um, your the questions you're asking in your work are hitting home. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, hi, June. 
Another West Coast artist. Um, thank you for your deep descriptions of your process. How do you feel about culture becoming proprietary and the current hypersensitivity against influences of patterns that are not from one's own cultural heritage? Um, I, could you repeat the question, um, please? Uh, I think I did not hear the whole thing. Sure, I think I read through it really quickly too. Um, how do you feel about culture becoming proprietary and the current hypersensitivity against influences of patterns that are not one's own from one's own cultural heritage or sourced from one's own direct cultural crossover? Well, you know, that that may that brings the question of the complexity of the world into question because you know, trade and commerce has created appropriation throughout the centuries, millennia in fact. And so who owns what is what I am trying to examine in my work. What belongs to whom is uh, I think uh, the question that most everybody asks because you know, we come from different regions or we, we take ownership of a country or a space, yet that particular location may have been somebody else's country and space millennia ago. And so how can you even say that this thing belongs to me? I feel like um, appropriation does happen, has happened in the past. Um, as long as we give credit to where we found something and then made it our own, I feel like that's my definition of appropriation. I mean, I'm appropriating um, patterns and redesigning them and remaking them into what I find my aesthetic to like. Um, but some of it is not from my country. You know, it's from Morocco or it, it's from the UAE, you know, it could be from any, it, sometimes I look at um, native cultures in the US and South America, and I'm astounded by the intricacies and the beauty that is, you know, within those works. Yesterday, when I was listening to the lecture from the Smithsonian, I was like blown away with all these beautiful embroideries by Posita, Abad and two other, you know, women um, who lived here in the U.S. and they were forgotten, and they brought their craft and heritages from their backgrounds into this new world, and left it for people to study and admire here. So there's a there's a movement, there's a sense of movement within the world through commerce that we can't ignore anymore. I think like we can't say that this is mine and I'm gonna hold on to it. Um, it may not have been mine to start with. Yeah, I think also um, when I think about your work, I, I think somebody could walk in and find connections with William Morris mm -hmm. um, and, and um, the arts, um, and craft movement and wallpaper, uh, which interestingly, you know, comes from the colonizers of um, South in South Asia. So exactly. that's intentional as well. I have to believe it is very intentional. And uh, you know, I exhibited that piece. It's called um, "Stealing Beauty," <laughs> and I meant it as a, you know, actually re-stealing it back. <laughs> you know, because. Um, um, William Morris appropriated a lot of design work from the Middle East and from South Asia and from other places. And so, and that became his work. And I used one of his flower heads in the piece titled Stealing Beauty. And almost nobody has ever identified what, which flower head it is that I used. But my reason for using it was not to kind of show him up or anything like that, not at all. My purpose was to suggest that, you know, commerce has made it possible for people across the world to experience things. And diverse cultures make our lives better. So it was a way to kind of admit to it, but also identify that appropriation has been happening for centuries. It's not like it happened only 
this century. It's been going on since um, man learned to walk, I think. <laughs> well, something um, to follow up with it, something that I'd, I'd heard you say in, um, in a uh, in an interview before was um, culture cannot exist without intersections. And I thought that is such a, that opens up such a wonderful opportunity um, for artists who are, who are like we are particularly interested in traditions of decorative arts around the world and um, how they feed each other and how they feed us as contemporary um, consumers of arts and material culture. Well, you know, Nava, you were able to identify the title of the show really well because the mashrabia is intersections. Yes, literally. It's personified literally an intersection of the gaze on either side, you know, looking through the perforations. And that is a fascinating idea. It's sort of like, you know, it speaks to how we hide and we wear many faces and how we interact with different populations then how economics can impact our our behavior and you know race can be, impact our behavior and the ways we interact with the world populations that that has a lot to do with intersectionality and um, um, I know that we can never satisfy everybody across the planet but we can try we can try to make policy better and I, I believe that that's um, one of the things that I try to do in my work to kind of reveal to people, you know, the word reveal is also very interesting because it talks about the mashrabia again, but reveal to people that you can be very intimate with a stranger and still, you know, have that dialogue, create a dialogue within that space that allows you to be safe. And um, it may come across as trite or really simple, but I think um, the idea of com communication requires that, it does, for us to be open and allow people to enter. So. Well, that's, that's a very optimistic. Um... Oh no, I'm very cynical now. <laughs> I'm becoming more and more cynical. And... I'm like thinking, you know, like we need to um, vote the people who actually do something about policy rather than just voting by rote because, you know, my parents did it, I'll do it the same way. I think we need to think and be thoughtful and intentful and make it very intentional who we elect as our representatives because often they are not doing the job. <laughs> I mean, the last administration was definitely an example. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, but you know, not much was accomplished, or whatever was accomplished was not, you know. Anyway, um, no, I think that's important to note, and I also think though that the gesture of making art and making certainly making a career out of making art demonstrates a kind of belief and a hope. We don't have to call it optimism, but we do call it a faith in something. Yes, faith in human nature, I think we can rise above it, I think. Yeah. We can all rise. Mm -hmm. Well, Aria has um, a very nice question here, and I'm going to share it. Um, has using new materials in your studio changed your thoughts and feeling about your work, abilities, and practice? It always does that. Um, I'm currently making these paintings with collage, and I'm using resin. Um, and you know, I love experimenting. I wish I had more time. I wish I had like 24 hours, 48 hours a day to work so I could kind of explore more avenues. But yes, it always teaches you something um, about yourself. How far can you go with something? How impatient you may be. Um, so the resin really teaches you patience and it uh, it makes you uh, it, it makes me work with planning. Sometimes I work very intuitively. And so I have to do the resin paintings very intentionally now because it dries really fast and I have to plan ahead. And so there's all this going on. And then I'm making these installation works that are so time consuming that I, I wonder 
where the patience comes from because I have no patience when I'm driving <laughs> or, you know, get annoyed with people. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> but, um, but in the studio, I have so much patience. It's unbelievable. And, um, you know, and I try new things because I think it teaches me about myself, my ability to sustain and persist and continue to go in spite of whether I'm successful or not. I think that that's, um, that's what I found about Pasita Abad because she just did it because she needed to do it. There were the three women, I don't remember the other two women's uh, names, but um, they were just amazing in what they were doing. And I was like uh, astounded by how little support they had in the past. And so it's, um, I've been very lucky. I, I, I'm really grateful that I have been able to show my work to such an international audience and also be able to continue to put work out there and make a living off of it somewhat. So that's that's just bloody awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that's a great way to end today. And I know I appreciate that everybody stuck around for an extra few minutes on a Friday evening. Um, but I, I want to finish up with um, Carolyn's comment, um, which is, uh, first of all, admiring your beautiful, complex work. She thanks you for sharing your thought and artistic processes with us. And we look forward to seeing the choices you will eventually make uh, for the presentation in 2023. Um, and uh, just, yeah, I second that. Um, everybody is invited to continue. Uh, I think our next um, Seeing Through Space Talk will be with Susan Afuna in January, uh, which is not that um, And um, so please join us for that. Um, and thank you so much, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. And I hope everyone has a safe and lovely weekend. Thank you so much, Nava. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Right. See you soon. All right. Bye.